Um, so thinking again about flux balance analysis at a high level, you have these pathways, uh, which we've talked about extensively. I just brought up this idea that you know some metabolites come in, uh, so thinking about compartments, some go out, um, and you know in some cases that may compete. So having a sense of what your system boundary is is important, both when it's a, a physiological boundary, like cellular membrane, or uh, for example in in Terry's case, you know, these are not all of the, the reactions that would occur in this organism, but you could still apply these principles um, just like you could any material balance to a subset, to a unit operation rather than your entire chemical plant um, by, by creating boundaries as such. Um, so then you have your different fluxes. And here, um, you know, there's just a designation difference between um, your, your flux vectors and, and sort of what's reflecting transport more. Um, and so you can write out these balances, format them in the way that we discussed last time with the stoichiometric matrix and a, a vector representing your fluxes. And then you, you, at some point you have to apply some constraints. And um, part of what we're gonna talk about today, uh, the limitations related to flux balance analysis may have a lot to do with both the knowledge that you have about your system usually very underdetermined, uh, as well as the constraints that you can place. And so in some cases, for example, if you were to know that one of your reactions is irreversible, even though the one here that's picked uh, is the only one that's depicted as um, reversible um, in this diagram, uh, if you know it's irreversible, that's a useful constraint. Um, and so you can set the, the, the reverse flux, for example, to zero, and there are other there are other um, constraints that you may be able to impose just based on knowledge from the literature or experimental um, perturbations that you've performed where you know that something doesn't really change. Um, it, something that used to be a part of this course when um, Machek and his advisor, Greg Stephanopoulos, would teach it, um, uh, this notion of flux control coefficients. And um, we know that's one way to also bake in regulation um, as well as uh, some of the kinetic information. Essentially, the idea is that some reactions are going to be able to contribute more towards controlling flux. Some are more, um, you know, fungible in terms of you could see flux change across a wide range of values for that particular pathway. Others are, um, uh, you know, stiff isn't the right word, but more recalcitrant to changing their flux. And so when you know that, you know, that might be a, a constraint um, that you can set. You can effectively bound what the flux is for a particular reaction. Um, and so then, uh, you know, there, there are solutions to um, the, this um, stoichiometric uh, set of balances. Uh, and a lot of times you apply an objective function. And if you're really interested in understanding what um, the native organism might be most likely to do, um, you might go about the approach of really just making more measurements and trying to make sure that uh, your solution fits, uh, it gets to those uh, answers or fluxes. But you can also use objectives that sort of maximize, say, for organismal growth or biomass accumulation. If you've got um, equations that represent, for example, ATP generation, NADH generation, or biomass accumulation, you know that those are all things that the organism wants to do. Um, and so you can set that as a basic objective function. That's the approach that some people have taken. And then figure out essentially what is the organism going to do. And, and then as you compare that with your experimentally measured fluxes, you, you iron out the differences. Um, we'll talk about other um, objective functions soon, too. Um, any questions before I go on? Okay. All right. Um, so uh, you're going to see a lot of images in today's slides, uh, some of which can be very um, briefly glossed over. But um, part of the idea here is uh, response surface landscapes. Um, or, or other three-dimensional ways of, of depicting solution space. 
Um, and so you can see uh, that you could represent this in, in this particular way and that a solution might be here at the edge. Um, and um, that is just how you have a, um, your, what is called your metabolic phenotype. Um, so these ideas of, of optimality, I mentioned one, the one that the organism is usually trying to do, which is to maximize growth. Um, so if you have some way of, again, tying some of the reactions that are made in your model um, to growth, uh, then you've given uh, in a, a very numerical form uh, an optimization function that an organism in, you know, via the computer could, could be trying to optimize for. Um, so in this process, you're doing metabolic pathway analysis as well as what's called here phenotype phase plane analysis. Um, and then you apply your, your balance analysis and you find um, this line of optimality and you're gonna lie anywhere along, at a point anywhere along the line of optimality. Uh, and that represents the idea that there might be many different solutions that would get you there. So your system is underdetermined. Um, so, Something conceptually to think about when you are trying to use this for metabolic engineering. Uh, we are assuming that we have made an intervention or are doing something that the organism doesn't want us to do. And so when we have a model like this, um, we can say um, eliminate a gene and therefore we've removed the enzyme that it encodes and we've maybe taken away a flux if that was the only enzyme responsible for that reaction. So then you could recalculate uh, what your um, fluxes are. And you could set as an optimization function, I want to maximize the production of this metabolite. So if you were to do something like that, that would fall into this category here of FBA of knockout. And you could arrive at an optimal solution um, that's in this feasible space where your knockouts get to that's represented here at point B. And this is with the understanding that, you know, uh, when you did that, when you didn't have the knockout uh, and you had done flux balance analysis, uh, you arrived at this point A. Um, in the early 2000s, um, there was a paper that published a, a concept that was known as minimization of metabolic adjustment. And this is the idea that what the cell is actually going to try to do isn't going to, it isn't going to go from A to B. And that's because the cell is still trying to, the cell, the cell is still trying to effectively balance what you want it to do and where it was before, which is, you know, partly a, a memory aspect, but that's not really uh, why it was there. It was there because it was trying to maximize growth. And so, this idea of uh, minimization of metabolic adjustment is really an algorithm just to say, well, what would the cell do to try to be in this solution space that still minimizes how much it has to change its metabolism from what it wanted to do in the first place? Um, and so that was a key innovation that helped result in more accurate predictions because it just reflected reality that, you know, cells are, are, are still trying to, to achieve their own goals. And that, um, frankly, I think it, metabol some metabolic pathways are more resistant to changing their fluxes than we as engineers might uh, think they are. 